Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today in our Little Italy of Los Angeles podcast. And we've got joining us Kathy McCabe. Thanks so much for being here, Kathy. I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, you are the host and founder of Dream of Italy. Don't we all dream of Italy, Kathy? I think so, especially this last year, right? We've had to dream of something to get through it. Isn't that the truth? What is Dream of Italy? Tell me about it, because I know that it's a show on PBS and it's also, you know, a subscription service, right? A magazine. So it is a that. little bit of everything. I founded it 19 years ago when I was a mere child as a membership website and subscription newsletter. It's now a subscription magazine. Seven years ago, we premiered a PBS series that continues to air and we have a new special coming out. There's a podcast, um, a travel service everything you need to travel to Italy and to dream of Italy. Let's talk about some of the different segments. Like when people tune in, they get the magazine, what can they expect to find in there? What can they learn about Italy? Um, which would be great for all of us really. So with the magazine, it's all about where to go, who to meet, what to eat, where to go shopping, a lot of experiential travel, like how to learn how to make a fresco or go truffle hunting. And it comes out six times a year. And when you subscribe, you get access to 180 back issues. And that is also the premise of the TV show. It's just hands-on experiencing Italy. Okay. You said where to go, who to meet. So once you went to the hotel uh, that I believe is owned by Francis Ford Coppola, is that correct? Yes, yes. Girl, you are something. Because it's not like you planned it or anything, right? But you end up scoring him on your show. Tell me how that happened. You know, I'm actually a believer in serendipity and things, uh, forces we are unaware of. But I actually, I went to his hotel, I believe it was 2012. We have a similar story that we both went back to Italy or went to Italy initially in our 20s because of our grandfathers to see our ancestral hometowns. His is in Bernalda and Basilicata. Uh, you know, he had great success as a film director and, and people may or may not know he has a hotel, various hotels, the family Coppola around the world. He opened Palazzo Margherita, a nine room beautiful hotel in his ancestral hometown. I went to review it. I was so touched by it because it, I, I felt the same thing I felt in my ancestral hometown. This was like his love letter to his ancestors. I wrote him a handwritten note that I just left at the hotel. I don't really know if they, I think they gave it to him. Um, like, excuse me, the note is for Francis, please. So yeah. Just, I really didn't think anyone would give it to him. I just, but I, it just was so, I was honestly as a human being just really touched because this wasn't even about him being a director. It was just, it was such a beautiful homage to our ancestors, right? We were all really poor when we came over and to have achieved this and give this back. And then in 2015, the first season of the special came out and the woman who had done PR for the hotel just wrote me a note and said, wow, good for you, congratulations. And I wrote back and I just said, do you think Mr. Coppola would ever want to do an interview? And it wasn't even like, a, and he said, yes. And you know what uh, it is, I'm telling you, people love talking about their Italian ancestry. They really do. I ran into, um, Quentin Tarantino at an event, right? So of course I took the opportunity to talk to him about Little Italy of Los Angeles and our podcast. And he wouldn't stop talking to me for the entire evening and see, he was sitting next to Anne Margaret, right? So people love all things yes. Italian. So you probably write really just tapped into something with Francis. Well, Italy right? brings us together. And I think if you have ancestry, as I know you do, it, it, it just, uh, it, it is this bond and, um, I, I don't know. And it was such a pleasure to meet him. He's a fascinating man. And we talk a lot about family, you know, which is the whole reason we were there and very important in his life. And he's part of the new special Dream of Italy, Travel, Transform and Thrive. And uh, people can tune in and see him, Sting and Trudy Styler, Francis Mays, other people whose names aren't as famous, but are as compelling to watch and how they change their lives the Italian way. Joe Montagna, wasn't he also um, part he's of- He's in it. He's yeah, in he's a, it. You know, he's a friend to Little Italy of LA. Um, in fact, he was there and he christened Little Italy, Los Angeles, that very first night that we designated that section of LA. He's a darling, right? He's so- he is, Anytime uh, he can help. Yeah, tell me. 
he's a true gentleman and I think they're rare. I had, I had one. My late father was truly a gentleman and, uh, I cold emailed him and was like, I'm doing this special and I, I, I need a co-host for the pledge breaks. And I know you have this story. So his story is similar to mine and Coppola's in his twenties. He went back because his grandfather, his grandfather wanted him to find, to see the ancestral hometown. And, uh, he went back to Puglia and he agreed to co-host it's a pledge special as well so if you watch and you want to get book dvd jewelry italian lessons so joe and i we actually filmed virtually we haven't met, met in person he is lovely and then you know he was in the godfather three with coppola so we're really keeping it all in the family um and so he also talks about his story in the pledge break so they're not just pitching you to give to pbs we're talking about uh, our ancestry. And as you said, everyone loves Italy and, and you know, Joe didn't need to do this. He has plenty of outlets, but he wanted to do it because he likes the show, but he also, he loves Italy and he wants to honor his ancestors too. Yeah, you talked about your dad, you know, um, Francis and Joe are different than you and I are because when they came here, right, they were speaking the language with their families. And that's one thing that you and I, have in common where I know that my family said, no, 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 you're an American, you speak English. And I'm thinking, oh man. And now I'm learning Italian and it's, it's not so easy, but I'm going to get there. Right. It's and not I easy. Just, yeah. I implore people to wherever you're from, right. Teach your kids that language. <laughs> Even yeah. if you can't speak it, put them in class or something. Don't you think? Well, the thing is a lot of Italian uh, immigrants wanted to be American. Um, yeah. And it wasn't cool to be Italian. There was a lot of discrimination. And so um, my grandparents were born here and they were born in 1902 and 1904, but they did speak a little bit only to each other when they didn't want me to, to know what they were saying, but they were very okay. Americanized and that, um, and so I think then there's now been this whole trend where we're going back to rediscover being Italian and re rediscover our ancestral roots. Mm. So talk to me a little bit about that, because honestly, you and I may even be related because <laughs> our ancestors come from the same area in Italy. We'll talk yes. about that. And then I found out that you grew up literally in the same town where I went to school at St. James. So let's talk a little bit about your background. So, so I'm from, I was, I grew up in Springfield, New Jersey. And then it turns out you grew up in Union, but you went to, it's not like these are big towns. Um, you no. went to the church, St. James. Um, I know right where that is. My grandparents went to that church. Um, we went to a different church called St. Rose, um, which was interesting. And then our all of our, our ancestors, which we've discussed, are from my mother's uh, side, are all from the province of Avellino, which is actually an extremely popular, a lot of immigrants came from Avellino. Even if you watch The Sopranos, Tony Sopranos from Avellino, um, it was rough. You know, it was a rough, it's beautiful place. I know you've been, I filmed uh, an episode there. I went back 26 years ago to, with my mother to find, refine mm -hmm. the town. Um, so a lot of Italian Americans come from there. And it was very funny. I was talking to somebody else before you. And I said, all roads lead back to, Av to Italy, usually Avellino or New Jersey. <laughs> It happens to be true, just ask Tony Soprano, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But let's talk a little bit about Avellino, since that's where both of our families are from. My family is from a tiny little mountain area, mountaintop called uh, Manucazzati and San Barbado. And there's this beautiful castle there uh, up in San Barbado. And I don't know, my family, when I went back to see them, um, they were just so gracious and, and lovely when I went back there to see the farm where my grandfather grew up and where he farmed and they're all still there working. Um, they're successful people. And it was lovely, just lovely. But I know it wasn't always like that. How about yeah. for you with your family in Avellino? So um, my great grandfather left in eight, like 1888. He came to the U S mm. he hurt his arm Ooh. and uh, they were going to amputate it. And he said, no way. And there's also this, Madonna in this town who's a worker of miracles which is a much longer story um, and he went back to the town was healed and then came back in 1890 and so you know maybe a cousin here or there went back 
Um, yeah. The grandfather went in the 60s, very long story, but it's in the Castle Vetri episode, tried to find the town, taken to the wrong town. He's, nine, he's 93 years old when my mother and I were going to Italy and we're like, we're going to this town. We go to the town. My grandfather dies 36 hours later, not knowing oh. we'd found the town or knowing. Oh, no, he felt it. I'm, I'm certain of it. Oh, he I must... know he did. And he or maybe very... it's like, oh, they found it. We were it. very close. And I feel that he gave me Italy and Castelvetere, you know, almost as this like, okay, I'm leaving, but you have this. So they're warm people. They're genuine people. They're authentic. They're crazy. <laughs> you know, Italians are crazy. I, and, and they're crazy. I say, we're, I say we're impassioned. That's what yeah, I Yeah, I mean, they're, um, they're beautiful people. They're real people. They're just very authentic and real. And I think they're very touched that I came back and I, I, I wanted to learn more. And, uh, and there's so many layers of history there. It's a beautiful area, as you know, and it's, really become much more of a wine, your pina, lots of wine, um, really being much more discovered these days. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, you, your background, right? You also were in the news business, like like I am and was, and which is why in a way this sort of came naturally to you. But when did you decide to pivot from working in news? Because I know that you worked at ABC News and do this. Like, what was the transition? So I worked at ABC for a while. I worked for a company they owned in London. I came back and then I worked for usatoday.com when they were launching these web, you know, websites, covered politics. And then I went to their travel section and I just love, always love travel. Since I found the town, I would go to Italy on my vacation. And I realized there's so many people that go back to Italy. It's a destination that we go back to. Um, and my friend, Rudy Max, that was one of the columnists I edited, he's a travel journalist and he had a subscription travel newsletter and it was on general travel. And I was having lunch with him one day and I said, what about Italy? And he's like, oh, do it. It's better to have a niche, you know, do it. And I always tease him. He actually has a PBS show now too. And I'm like, you got me into this. And I started it in 2002. Um, what a long running relationship, 19 years. <laughs> Wow. And it's because wow. it, it is, it's staggering. You know, life goes fast too. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm like shocked more than anybody that it's been 19 years, but there's so much about Italy. It's, it's endless. Um, and then there's always new experiences and new things. Well, there's so much to learn because each region is so different. I mean, I so worked in Milan. Yeah. I mean, I worked in Milan when I was a young girl. Um, and then let's face it, it's so different than the Southern region where, yeah. where we're from. And then of course you continue South Sicily. It's a whole different thing. That's the beauty of that country. It's so different. And you, there's so many different yes. fields to it, right? Yes. That's what I love. So you take us on your show pretty much everywhere, right? Yes. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's endless from town to town. The foods are different. The traditions are different. And you know, Italy is a relatively young country. And so when, also when you came over, you all went to like, from Castelvetere, they went to Stanford, Connecticut, and they went to New York, and they went to Munson, Mass. And um, you much more related to that town than the, you know, Italy was just a new country than Italy right. itself. So each place is, is unique in its own, own thing. It's really, it's staggering how rich of a place it is. Yeah, now I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but first, and I also want to know about some of the sponsors you have, but first, I actually have to mention a sponsor that that I have that's a new sponsor, and one is called HarperCollins, um, you know, about summer reading. Um, the Lost and Found Bookshop is one book in particular they'd like people to pick up, and also Fairty, the clothing company, and I'm going to talk about all this sort of at the end of our podcast, but I wanted to mention that because I'm actually so excited if people can sort of uh, pick up a book from HarperCollins or, or go to uh, fairtybrand.com. That would be fabulous. Um, but for you, right, how do you get all your sponsors? Because I know that you do it primarily on your own. Is that right? Or does PBS <laughs> yeah. help you with this? Near, no. <laughs> no. And sponsors do make the world go round for all these programs that we're doing. No, I um, raise all the own, all the money, all the sponsorships myself. I've had like one or two people help me snag some of the smaller sponsors. Um, but I do what's different than what I do from what I do than other television shows is I do all the business of the show. That's hard. Well. That's hard. It's very hard. 
and more time consuming than doing the show. Honestly, you could do an entire trip to Italy and plan that and shoot it and edit it. And at least for me, the advertising part is like harder. I, I tried, you know, I haven't really sat and calculated it, but I feel like less than 10%, maybe 5% of what I do is appear on screen. You know, so I'm doing all the pitching sponsors, the agreements, the, uh, you know, the agreements with the crew, the accounting, the, the all kinds of things. And public television is really supported by these individual sponsors, corporate sponsors, and then also the donors when we have a pledge special who get right. money. And this time I'm really excited. I'm always excited, but we have a nice lineup because they're all complimentary. So we have DiCecco pasta, which I felt like was a huge accomplishment. They're such uh, an authentic, amazing brand. Monteverdi, a wonderful place to go stay in Tuscany. Uh, Vietri, she uh, brings in ceramics and Italian decor. Mm. Uh, ItalyAncestry.com for those of us that want to explore our heritage and even try to claim citizenship. And this wonderful small company in Kansas called Seeds from Italy. I don't know about you, but my grandfather had that garden. They do all heirloom seeds for like hundreds and hundreds of vegetables and flowers. And, That's and neat. Yeah. And, um, you know, in the show, we visit Sting's garden on his estate in Tuscany. And, and then. Hang on. Who? <laughs> Sting. <laughs> okay. Why aren't I working with you? Because. Um... <laughs> Boy, do I have a sting story for you, but that's going to be do. off the air. You do. Interesting. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm going to tease you a little bit. That'll be off the air. But uh, <laughs> well, you ended up in Sting's garden with his wife. Judy, and right? I just ended up there. They dropped me. I just dropped there. So I had the opportunity to interview. You're like Zelig, but go ahead. <laughs> sting and his wife, you know, they have um, an estate. They create, they, they produce wines that you can buy all over the U.S. And olive oil. They have a farm shop. They, they oh. do so many things. They're so multi-talented. You know, Trudy, her, his, his wife is very talented director. Uh, he's producing the music, but they love Italy and they love the land. And they've created these award-winning wines that are oh. not that too expensive. And they're really good. One is named Roxanne. So that's easy to remember. That is so cool. So like, what was it like hanging out with Sting and Trudy for the I day? I don't know if we were like mm -hmm. hanging out, but... <laughs> They, you know, they're very relaxed because it was summer. This was August, 2019. It was really hot. Uh, they're in, he's in his hat. Um, you, you know, you, you might not know it's even sting. I mean, you kind of know, but they love Italy. They're really relaxed. They love the land. I found them to be very down to earth and very welcoming. And I do think that Italy, just like you and I bonded talking about our, our, our heritage, you know, Italy is just easy to talk to people about and e e an easy thing to bring people together. So I think they're incredibly eloquent w in what they have to say about this place. So how long is your special, the PBS special? How many episodes so and how long per it's episode? It's just one special. So it's not a one. series. Uh, there's mm -hmm. other, there's two seasons you can watch. Um, right. Base special is 60 minutes, which you can see that in some places on PBS, but then Joe joins me for an extra 30 minutes, which is 90 minutes. If you go to dreamofitaly.com slash TTT, the challenge with PBS is you have to put your zip code in. You have to like all the markets air it at different times. Although June 26 is a big prime time airing across almost 90% of the US. So people can see it and it's all about how Italy can change your life. And you don't have to be Sting or Coppola to let it change your life. Well, when's the first episode airing? You said, because this is a whole new season. What day is that? It's not a whole new season. It's just one special. It's airing. Right, but it's a new special that'll be out all season. So, yeah, um, for years. Let's look yeah. at it that way. Um, but when's the first day that we can we can look that it's up? It's on. It started airing a few days ago. So, oh, it did? Okay. Yeah, oh, but wow. Those are so we've got great time. There's a big, um, a lot of markets next week will be airing mm. it. And But the beauty of PBS which is so different. And I know, you know, TV so well, it repeats. So for instance, season yeah. one is six years ago, it's still airing. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So it repeats and repeats and repeats. And, um, and so people get to see it a lot. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the episodes. It could be this new episode or previous episodes that really stuck with you. Obviously, you know, those famous folks that we talked about, but you know, where were you? Um, just so we could tease people a little bit to go and look it up, look up the special that really resonated with you, that stuck with you, that you oh. remember it. Uh, tell me. 
Well, my greatest personal and professional accomplishment is the uh, episode I did going back to Castelvetre with my parents right. who have since passed away. Um, and it just, it, it meant everything to me. And I think it's an episode that touches people because we all come from somewhere. So that's a great one. Um, I also think even we did a whole episode with Mr. Coppola, even though he's also in this special. Basilicata also, I love Southern Italy, you can tell. You know, it's a fascinating place and talking to him, but we've done Venice, Bologna. I mean, the food, we did a lot of great food, making tortellini um, in Bologna, Florence. I usually know everything we're going to do and or I planned what we're going to do, but I didn't know we were going up on a cherry picker on the side of the Duomo. And that was one of the most magnificent things I've ever seen because it's a perspective you don't usually see. We were looking to see how they repair the Duomo. Um, and I was so, I wore a dress. I really didn't know we were doing this. And Whoa, I, how high up did you go? You don't understand. I'm afraid of heights. And if they did that to me, they'd have to put me about six inches up and just shoot like I'm on the top. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do the Duomo. I mean, but I it was I didn't have time to be scared. I, I'm not my my editor Chuck is here. He was the cameraman. He was the cameraman. But you know, he had to go. That's what we do. And you know, in Italy, like, do you trust Italians? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know these people operating it. But it was too cool that and to see Florence, just to see it. <laughs> to see the Duomo, to touch the Duomo up there. It was, that's memorable for me. And I think the people yeah. watching can see that it really was so genuine, my excitement, because I, I had no idea where you're gonna do it. So a lot of people, uh, especially those people who are first timers, um, you know, they're going to see Rome and Florence and all the hot spots because you kind of have to, right? You have to learn about the history, at least in the bigger places that are so well known. But then where do you suggest that people go totally off the beaten path do they roam around do they um take the train and just do stops i mean we're kind of famous for doing that we plan a little bit like even with my three kids it's like everybody gets one backpack not big luggage and of course by the end of the trip we have big luggage because we sure. buy stuff, right I mean, but where do you go what do you do how do you do it like an italian because i know I you teach us how to do italy like an italian <laughs> Well, they would go, they go to the same beach for 30 years in August. I mean, they're kind of creatures of habit. Of be That's a very Italian uh, experience to go to the beach. They, they're they like on top of each other. They really do love community. It's just, I think <laughs> they really the like, beach. they like yeah. people. I'm an only child. I don't need people around me all the time, but they like to be like <laughs> on top of each other. But, you know, it's really your interests. You know, do you love World War II? Do you, are you interested in art? Um, Sicily, I mean, that's for a little more adventurous. If you're comfortable driving, I love driving in Italy. You have to be pretty comfortable. You can just, just, you know, plan a few things and then leave a few days and see what you come upon. It's really hard to go wrong. Yeah, isn't that the truth? It's hard to go wrong. You know, it's a beautiful area as well, Carrera. Oh my God, yes. it was so stunning. You know, the marble mines. I'd like there. to film something there because it's just so like visual. Colorful. Yeah. It's colorful is what it is. And it's my sort of grandfather, stunning. one of them, great grandfather was a stonemason. I mean, that's a big Italian trade. Yeah, you've got to go there. Also, so many tourists go to the Positanos, right? And, and that side of Italy. But we don't often see enough about the other side. Oh, um, that's one of my favorite sides. Really? Yeah. So tell me about that, because that's some that's an area I haven't explored myself. Oh, you'll like it. Um, yeah. We did two episodes. One is Abruzzo, which, you know, is on the Adriatic, and then Puglia. And Puglia is where I would probably buy a house besides Tuscany. But Abruzzo is famous. They have these trabocchi. They're these huts, fishing huts. You walk Ooh. on this plank, and then you you there's like a restaurant, and they're catching the fish fresh. The fascinating thing is they built them because they were farmers. And they were terrified of the ocean. So they didn't want to like go in the boat. They wanted to have, and so those dot the coast. Puglia, I can't even say enough. I mean, stone walls, flat, you can ride bikes, huge olive trees, wow. beaches, truly these like conical um, houses. You're, face, you're on the Adriatic, you're facing mm -hmm. um, Greece. It's, uh, it, it's incredible. That whole area is just beautiful, as you said, facing Greece. And as you go south, right, 
there's so many feels, there's, there's Greece, there's Morocco, there's Spain, and you really feel the different cultures blending together, which I think is fascinating. I also want to get to know more about Sicily. You know, in our little Italy of Los Angeles community, we have quite a few people who are from that southern region. And I've learned quite a bit about that from then. Uh, so that's also it's fascinating very... because sadly everyone invaded Southern Italy or Italy. So you have, again, my, my ancestors were Norman. My father, my grandfather had red hair. It was full Italian, red hair and blue eyes. So everyone was, was in Italy. So there's lots of influences, Greek, Norman, Spanish. Hang on. Where did the McCabe come from? <laughs> You can That's guess. not an Italian name. That's that my, my father, Irish. He was Irish. Okay. I have Irish descent. So, and you know, with New Jersey, it's a very popular combination to be half oh, Irish, half absolutely. Italian. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I know you're single and you do quite a bit of travel. Have you met any nice um, Italian gentlemen? <laughs> <laughs> I have. Oh, it's okay. It's last. <laughs> It didn't last. Well, it is a little far away, right? But uh, it is. You know, they uh, they are wonderful for a romance. <laughs> oh, good yeah. to know that, right, yeah. ladies? Good to know well, they're wonderful I for think, romance. You know, they they do. You know, they really do. They're really um, men are men and women are women in Italy. I mean, it's it's that's good. It's very, that. Right. Let's just say it's a very passionate. Um, look, I'm Italian on both sides, so I got it from everywhere, right? But you're right, it's very passionate uh, people. Let's just say that, right? So the men are the men and the women are the women. It's, it's yeah, very exciting. No, and I think I'm sure. that when you're in Italy, for good or bad, so sometimes it's not, um, you can sometimes feel like more of a w woman. And, and, and I interviewed this woman, Arlene, in the special, and this we added this bite to the DVD. She said to me, straight men in Italy will notice your shoes. And it's true. So oh. men and women, Italians in general, but men appreciate beauty. Um, but it doesn't have to be like traditional beauty. Just they're very observant, I think, as people. So they mm -hmm. they notice like, did you do your hair differently? Are you wearing a piece of jewelry? Are they they're very detail oriented? And you also that that extends everywhere. You have the nonas who are looking out the window to see what's going on outside. You know, they're very very observant. So well, my I, husband is uh, definitely not Italian because he's not <laughs> observant. He won't notice what shoes I'm wearing or my hairstyle is different. So. Um, that's good to know too. <laughs> so it's an interesting, it's an interesting place that I think, I think maybe in general, we just feel more alive there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Before I let you go, a lot of people uh, very briefly talk about citizenship and there's all kinds of different things. Like you can't do it if your maternal right. grandmother was I, like, it confused me. And I did a show on it once. And uh, can you imagine? I have to do it again so that it, like it sticks citizenship yeah. and also buying a place there right yeah like lorraine brocco i believe is down in uh sicily and i think she bought um something down there that's a little cheaper and then she's redoing it she did the I, one I, euro deal but you have to you have to put a lot of money in to fix it so it it's not always the bargain you think it is no i know so that's what i yeah. mean like could you tell us before i let you go a little bit about buying a place how would you go about doing that and also citizenship whatever you can tell us um what's the, sort of the best and easiest way if that's possible to so go we, about we cover all these bunch of these topics in the new special so if you go yeah. to dreamofitaly.com slash ttt i've also written a finishing a uh, companion book where we really go into the legalese and things like that citizenship it's done you're a sanguinous which is by right of blood so the premise is if you're born to an italian anywhere in the world and that person's still italian the child is italian but there are a few mm. rules here and there um it's great to to contact a company a lot of them uh, offer free consultation our sponsor is italy's ancestry.com you call them up, you say, this person was born here, naturalized, didn't naturalize, born there. And Melanie can give you an idea whether you can qualify. And then you can get an EU passport. You can live, go back and forth to Italy, no visas needed, things like that. Buying a house, I think you got to be pretty sure. It's a big thing. I don't think renovating is as easy as it looks. Um, and then Italians don't, they're not flipping houses. You know, they're mostly staying in the same area. Mm. Um, but it's doable. There's, you want a great real estate agent. There's one I interview in the book. His name is Sean Carlos. He's American, 
but he's lived in Italy the last 30 years. So he's like a good, uh, a licensed real estate agent. And you have to see what you're, what you're getting into. And I think if you want to sell it quickly or flip it, that's not the reason to do it. But you should go first, spend three months, spend a winter, you know, really see if that's the place. Because everyone thinks they want to live in the Tuscan Villa until it's winter or until it's 20 minutes drive somewhere. So mm -hmm. people have to think about it. Or Florence, if you're an expat, there's so many events. You can meet tons of people if you're in the city. So you might not actually want what you think you want. Good to know. You're right. You do need to spend time there because there's yeah. so many flavors of Italy, everything from their food to culturally, right? So you're right. Spend the time, take the time as an Italian would, right? Live like an Italian, take they the slow. time they do to know slower. what you want. I mean, here in yeah. America, it's like, come on, come on, come on. Where do you want a place? Like, no, oh, and I, I think that's know. what people are like, oh, I'm going to go buy a place. Well, there's no rush. There's no. no rush. And I think it's, you know, it's a bigger deal if you're doing it from here. Uh, but it could be a wonderful feeling, right? To have your little piece of land. So tell me what you're working on next. I believe a memoir, correct? And then yeah. let's give a shout out to your new show before we. Uh, the memoir is, is about Italy and my family and my ancestors mm -hmm. and my parents and all the crazy things that happened to bring it all together and all the signs and a little bit about grief. And I have crazy stories about um you know the things that are sort of unseen and it all comes back to Italy and I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't lived it so I'm working on that this summer even if it never sees the light of day for my own soul because it's like I have to tell the story and then the show I hope everyone tunes in dream of Italy travel transform and thrive on PBS stations if you come to dreamofitaly.com slash TTT, you put your zip code in, it'll tell you what day, what station. If it's not airing the next few weeks, come back. It it ends up airing on the whole, all over the country. It just airs on different weeks and different days. And I hope it inspires people to follow a dream. It doesn't have to be Italy, but I think I get these emails from people and I realize it's not about Italy always. It's about a permis permission to dream and to do something different with their lives. Absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining us thank today. You, Ms. I appreciate your delight. Oh, and a shout out to our dear friend Janine who introduced us, which yes. is wonderful. Uh, maybe we will all sort of connect in Italy one day over at Monteverdi, so. which would be fabulous. And uh, it's just been a, really a lot of fun. And it would be great to maybe collaborate and do something with you, maybe go to Italy. And bring yeah. bring a group of people. Wouldn't that be what fun? Like we've been, we have to, to figure LA. this out. I'd What's that? To, I'd love to come back to LA and experience um, Little Italy of LA as well. So there's a We're, lot of Italy in America, which is fascinating too. Yeah, obviously, right? I mean, people yeah. can't get enough of it. If you have a little drop of blood in you that's Italian, it's like that's good enough for everyone else. So yeah. <laughs> that's just terrific. So we welcome you here in Los Angeles. I'll so be anytime. Here. Okay. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, everybody, for joining us for our Little Italy of Los, Ang Los Angeles podcast. And I'm your host, Deborah Zara Kovelt. And uh, we appreciate you being here. And I think we're just going to put up our Little Italy banner. And after that, I'm going to play an ad from Harper Collins. Everybody, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. I just read the most amazing book. And I'd love to recommend it to all of my viewers and listeners. It's called The Lost and Found Bookshop by New York Times bestseller Susan Wiggs. And it's available now on paperback at harpercollins.com. It is perfect as a summer read by the pool, the beach, the lake, or if you're traveling by plane. So here's the premise. Natalie Harper inherits a financially strapped bookshop in San Francisco after her mother dies. She also becomes the caretaker to her grandfather, and it's books that become a welcome retreat for her grief and tough times. People Magazine calls the book a feel-good family saga. I call it incredible. In fact, I felt for Natalie, and I wanted to know what else she found inside the pages of those books. The Lost and Found Bookshop is about life's ups and downs and how we get through them. Pick it up at harpercollins.com, and remember, tell them Deborah Cobalt sent you. That's the Lost and Found Bookshop. Thank you very much, Kathy, for joining our show. And thank you, everybody, for letting me run our ad because we were excited that today is the start to the um, the campaign. So um, there you go, HarperCollins. And our other ad, 
is probably going to run in our uh, next show. So thank you very much, everybody. And we will see you next time on Little Italy of Los Angeles. Bye-bye. Thank you.